Let's, let's turn. Oh, man, we're in a favorite section. Get your notepad out. Because we're going to be moving through chapter 5 into chapter 6 this morning. And probably one of the most controversial sections of the Scripture um, that, that, that exists in the Bible. Um, and you'll see why in a few moments. But just keep in mind, now Paul is moving from saying that Jesus is superior to angels. You remember back in chapter 1, because the angels, rabbis believe, were the ones who took the law from the hand of God and gave it to Moses. It was through the medium of angels. We have a better mediator. Our mediator is not an angel. He's superior. Our mediator, the one who brings God's commandments to us. And oh, and by the way, they're not written on tablets of stone. They're written on our hearts. The one who brought them to us is his son, the second person of the Godhead. And he's superior to Moses. Because Moses gave us the covenant of the law, which we could never keep. And the law was never made to make a man righteous. It can't. It was only to show your great need for the righteousness that Jesus would bring to us. And so he's superior to Moses, we've seen. He's superior to the law. Because again, the law was never made to make us righteous. It was only to show us. It's a mirror that we look into that we're not and we need a Savior. And then he said, well, he's superior to Joshua. Joshua took the people into the promised land, but there's a rest. That wasn't the rest God promised. There's a rest that still remains for God's people. And what is the rest? When we cease from our own labors. And then he told us last week, as God labored six days on the seventh day, he rested from all of his works. So we have a rest. In Christ Jesus, we can rest from all of our works. Because salvation is already a done deal. Amen. And so we're going to see that this morning as he moves into chapter 5 and he compares the Levitical priesthood. Now notice this, if you're a note taker, he's going to put forth the Levitical priesthood and the weakness of the Levitical priesthood. Because Aaron was the first high priest. We're going to see what the job of the priest was to do. And Aaron, listen, just months before he was made the high priest, we're going to see this morning, was, was leading the people into idolatry. But the priesthood that we have today is, is of the Melchizedek order. Because the question is going to be asked by these Jews leaving now the salvations in Christ and going back to the law. That's why Paul writes the letter to the Hebrews. He's saying, you're going back to an inferior priesthood. Because the priesthood of Aaron and the Levitical priesthood, listen, it never took away your sin. It covered it with all of those sacrifices, but it never removed it. This man, Jesus Christ, by one sacrifice, removed your sin forever. He made you just as though you never were a sinner. Well, how can he be a priest? Again, the Jews would say, because he's not of the line of the Levites. Well, his priesthood predates. It's an ancient priesthood. It's after the order of Melchizedek. And we're going to see as we're introduced to Melchizedek uh, this morning. He's only mentioned like four times in the Old Testament. We have chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 talking about this Melchizedek priesthood. Because when Abraham came back from the battle, Melchizedek, king of Salem, a priest, a king and a priest goes out to meet him, brings communion to him, and then Abraham ties to him. He is a type of Christ. And so we're going to see this morning that our priesthood is a better priesthood. And because of that, you cannot sin away your salvation. He's going to use an absurd absurdity to prove that point as we get into the first part of chapter 6. So we're going to unpack a lot of stuff this morning. Put your thinking cap on. Open your heart and your minds and pray for permanency as we move through this section. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. You know... Again, so many people that are unlearned and so many people that are just babes who haven't studied to show themselves to prove misunderstand this section. In fact, this section is where the teaching comes from in the Armenians camp that you can sin away or lose your salvation. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so help us this morning, Lord. You know, Paul says these things are hard to understand. And he said those who are unskillful in the word of God just don't get it. But we are meat eaters. We're not just milk drinkers. We're meat eaters here at Gold Country Calvary Chapel. We want to chew it all the way to the bone this morning. So help us to do that, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Chapter 5, verse 1. 
Remember now, he's coming back to this whole concept that we have a high priest. You see, no Jew would ever, ever approach God without a priest. It was the job of the priest in those days as you came into the presence of God to offer your sacrifice for your sin. It was the priest that you met at the outer court. It was the priest that led you over to the altar. It was the priest that instructed you to put your hands, as it were, on that sacrificial lamb and then would tell you, now confess your sins. And as it were, your sins were being transferred in the Old Testament from your confession onto that lamb. And while you were confessing your sin, it was the priest that would slit the throat of the lamb and bleed it out. You would feel the consequence of your sin because you could feel the life force bleeding out of that sacrificial lamb. And then he would take that lamb and prepare it, offer it upon the altar. And when you left, he would declare you to be atoned for. And that word atone comes from the Hebrew word kofar, which we get cover. It only covered your sins. It never removed it. It can't remove it. It was just a type of the Lamb of God who was to come, who would remove our sins. And so he's going to remind us that, listen, Aaron and the Levitical priest was only a type of the priest, our priest, our high priest, who was to come and offer himself as the sacrifice for sins. Not just atone for sin, not just to cover it. Not to do what the high priest did every year when he would go into the most holy place and offer a sacrifice once a year for the sins of the nation of Israel. And if God accepted what the high priest had to offer, then the sins of the nation of Israel for that year were atoned. They were just covered. It wasn't that they were removed. It's just like God put a cover over them. But he tells us of this high priest that we have. Can you imagine? Wrap your hands around it. We're going to see in chapter 7 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 by one sacrifice. He has perfected forever them that he made holy. Say to your neighbor, Jesus made me holy. He did. He did. The word for justification we read there in Romans chapter 5 means to be made just as though you never were a sinner. That's why he can say in, in chapter 10 of the same book, in verse 17, your sins and your iniquities, I remember no more. Because they're not covered. They're removed. And so Paul is challenging these Hebrew people that are going back to the law, back to the sacrifices, back to temple worship, back to those things for justification, back to the Levitical priesthood. He's saying, what, what are you doing? That's an inferior priesthood. That priesthood can't remove your sins. It was only a type of what Jesus would do. We serve a high priest who's ascended into the heavens. Jesus the righteous. And he offers you not just to cover your sins, but to remove them. You know, he's saying, what, uh, Yahweh, what are you thinking? Are you, you know, and then, well, of course, he writes to the Galatians and said, who hath bewitched you? Oh, foolish Galatians. Uh, that word foolish, I told you what it means. You, you idiot. That's what it means. You moron. You know, I'm glad that, you know, the English dresses it up some. He said, you moron, you idiot. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? Why would you go back to the law when we have a better covenant and a better high priest? And the covenant we have didn't come from angels. It came from the son of God. It wasn't a man, Moses, who gave us the law. It was a man, Christ Jesus, that gave us grace. It's better than Joshua. Joshua only took us into the promised land. Jesus will take us into heaven. And then he says, he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Because the question is being asked, how can he be a high priest? How can he even be a priest? Because he's not of the Levitical line. And then he's going to answer that. So here again, let's just back up into chapter 4, get a run at it. Let's just get back up to uh, verse 15. Because this is the context. Remember, when the Bible is written, there was no chapter or verses, no breaks. Written as a letter. And sometimes we have to back up just to keep things in context. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That's why Jesus Christ, the eternal word, had to take on human form. Because as by one man sin came in the world, Romans 5, by one man sin can be taken out of the world. Uh, the, the wages of sin is death, somebody has to die. 
Jesus died. But he had to be a perfect sacrifice in order to take away sins. But what the point is here is that, listen, everything that you're tempted with, how many were tempted this way? How many in those temptations you may have failed and fallen? Jesus is able to stand before the Father and make intercession for you and me because he says, I know what they're going through. God the Father doesn't. He's perfect in all of his ways. He's holy. But Jesus took on human form so he could feel those temptations. He was tempted with the lust of the flesh. He was tempted with materialism. He was tempted with pride. On that 40 days when he's fasting, Satan comes and he tempts him and he tempts him. He's tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. He even prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, as we're going to see in the text this morning. Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But he learned obedience by the things he suffered as an example to us. And so we have this faithful high priest, which has been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And, and it says, in all points, in all points, he's been rejected. He, he had his family, his mother and his brothers think he's crazy. How many have family members that just think you're crazy because you're a Christian? Well, Jesus had it. There's not a thing you have gone through in this life. There's not a difficulty that you've experienced. There's not a valley of the shadow of death that you passed through that Jesus hasn't already done that and is very compassionate toward you. Only he was without sin. He said, therefore, let us come boldly. That's unashamedly. That's without any condemnation. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might receive help or obtain help and mercy and grace in the time of need. When you have fallen, he says, the door is open. Come in. Come on in. It's the throne of grace. And you will receive mercy. You will receive help in a time of need. Now we move into chapter 5. For every high priest taken from among men. Now he's going to explain why the Levitical priesthood is inferior to the priesthood of Jesus. He said, because every priest is taken from among men, is ordained for men in the things that pertain to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifice for sin. That was the job of the priest. And especially the high priest. Because the high priest once a year was to go into the very holy place, offer upon the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant that sacrifice of blood. And if God accepted it, then again, the, the sins of the nation of Israel were atoned for for that year. Now, if he went in there and he wasn't perfect, see, they had to tie a rope around his foot. They put bells on the bottom of his garments. Because when he went in from the holy place to the most holy place, if all of a sudden they didn't hear the bells... And they heard a thump. Then they'd have to drag him out. Because at that moment, God did not accept the offering. And for that year, the judgment of God and the consequences were upon the nation of Israel. But if they heard the bells and they heard him in there praising God, then he, they would know. You see, we have a high priest that lives in the presence of God. And this is what he's, the point he's going to make. Listen carefully. There are ordained of men. Well, let, let, let me just give you a couple verses so that you'll know what we're talking about here. When he says ordained of men, here's the job in the Old Testament. When we read uh, Exodus chapter 28, verses 29 and 30. This is the job of the priesthood. As Aaron now and the Levitical line are being established, it says this, and Aaron shall bear the names of, of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. You had the 12 tribes, each one were represented by a stone, and they were embedded into this breastplate, and it was to be worn on his heart. It's the idea is that you and I, this is a type, are, listen, we are engraved upon the heart of Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we're engraved upon his heart because he loves us, he can, he can come into the very presence of God and intercede for us. And so it's upon his heart when he goeth in into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Now, it's not a one-time thing. It's continually. And listen, it says, And thou shalt put in the breastplate of the judgment the Urim and the Therm. White stone, black stone. Some of you know that phrase. Well, they're blackballed. Well, because they did something wrong and they pulled out the black stone and so the Urim and the Thurim, and they shall be upon, the, upon Aaron's heart 
when he goes in before the Lord, and Aaron shall bear, listen carefully, Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. That was the job of the high priest. It's, it, the imagery is, is that Jesus bears us on his heart before the Father. He ever lives to make intercession for us. You know, Father, I, I know that Mike Warren failed this week, I, you know, and I, I see his heart is broken, but you have no idea the struggle, how he fought against that. He said, you know, he, he just really prayed earnestly that the blue hairs and the gray hairs wouldn't pull out in front of him on the way to church, and they did anyway. Satan sent that person, and, 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 and it, you know, it grieves his heart, and he's interceding for us. Leviticus 16, 5 and 6 says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of a goat for a sin offering. So the priest would come in and offer the sin offering for the nation of Israel. But get this in the very next verse. It says, And Aaron shall offer a bullock of sin, a sin offering, which is for himself. And so before he could go in and deal with the sins of the nation of Israel, he had to deal with his own sin. Can you imagine Aaron who could be a compassion high priest, priest? Because three three months later, he's you know worshiping around in a drunken orgy, a golden calf, and then God takes him and puts him before the tabernacle in the priestly garment, sprinkles oil and blood on him, and makes him the first high priest. So Aaron could have compassion. You know, when people come to to Aaron, you know, uh, as a high priest or one of the priests, they could say, "Yeah, I understand, man. Those blue hairs, they're something, huh? Yeah, they are." Well, you know, I just had to offer a sacrifice for him too. And so bring yourself over here and I'll offer one for you. That was the Levitical priesthood. But Jesus is perfect. But he, being in human form, he can still understand. And so listen carefully. That's what the priests do. And then it says, who can have compassion on the it says ignorant, but it means ignorance or ignorance. Those who ignore the things of the Lord and to them that are out of the way, those who have strayed. Because sometimes we just ignore God's word and we, we, we transgress. How, how many have done that? Don't raise your hand. Do not raise your hand. You know, because we, we, we ignore what God has to say or because we ignore it, we just kind of get taken out of the way. Any of you got taken out of the way, do not raise your hand. For that he himself also is compassed with those same kind of infirmities. And by reason hereof we ought, as for the people, also for himself to offer sins. That's what the Levitical priesthood had to do. No man taketh this honor unto himself. No man chooses to be that. You had to be born in the line of Levi to do that. But he's called of God as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made the high priest, but it was said of him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And again, as we said before, if you go back to Acts chapter 13, long about verse 32, we understand what the word begotten means. In, in fact, just let me read it to you real quick. You don't need to turn there. They'll put it up on the screen. He said, And we declare unto you good news. You know, the gospel is good news. If you got somebody preaching at you saying, you're a sinner, that's not good news. Hey, I knew I was a sinner before I got saved. I knew that. How many knew you were a sinner before you got saved? And for someone to tell you what you already know, that's not good news. Don't tell me what I am. Tell me how to get out of what I am. Amen? Good news is, hey, there's hope. There's forgiveness. There's a cleansing. You can be made a new creature in Christ Jesus. He will pour out his grace upon you abundantly. The only thing you need to do is come broken and receive it. And so he says, and we declare unto you these good news, these glad tidings, how that the promise, not something you earn, the promise which was made unto our fathers. Now God hath fulfilled in the same unto their children in that he raised up Jesus from the dead. How do we know that our sins are removed to the degree and to the extent it, he's made us just as though we never were sinners? Because of the resurrection. Because of the resurrection. Many good teachers have come and gone. But Jesus rose from the dead. And he was on this earth for 40 days after the resurrection. Seen at one time by over 500 people as he ascended into heaven. Was seen of all of the apostles, pieces and parts at a time, but all of them at once. 
And also, when he rose from the dead, many graves opened, and some of your loved ones will be knocking on our door. Who is it? Uncle Harry. You, you imposter. Uncle Harry, he, he died five years ago. Well, it's me. Open the door. I, am, I only got a short time to be here. Can you imagine? Maybe you don't want Uncle Harry to knock on your door. I don't know. But, but, he's, but he said, but God fulfilling the children, that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten you. It amazes me that people don't let the Bible interpret it. Because the Jehovah wants to see he's a created being, he's begotten. That's not what it's saying. Paul understood. Paul understood to be begotten means that Jesus, just like it says in Psalms 2, he raised up Jesus from the dead. That's why we can know. If he would have stayed in the tomb after three days, then we have no hope. That's what Paul would say. Listen, if there wasn't the resurrection, we'd be men most to be pitied because we really wouldn't have a hope. Listen, the whole thing pivots on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. He has ascended to the Father. He is there as our high priest interceding before the Father for you and me. Aaron died and is still in the grave. Every other priest died still in the grave. Jesus rose from the dead. He's our high priest. Not after the order of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood, but we're going to see this morning after the Melchizedek order. And so he says, but Christ glorified not himself to be made this high priest. And then it says, thou art my son. Capital S. We're little s, sons and daughters. My son, today have I raised you from the dead to prove that you are who you said you were. As it saith in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So again, they're saying, well, how can Jesus be a high priest? He's, he's born of the tribe of Judah. He's not of the tribe of Levi. And here Paul's going to say his priesthood predates. It's an ancient priesthood. It predates the Levitical priesthood. In fact, we know that from Genesis chapter 14. Don't turn there for sake of time because I want to get into chapter 6 this morning, but let me read it to you. Here's where we first pick up this thing of Melchizedek. It's in Genesis chapter 14, and it's in verse 18 and 20. We'll just read. Now, you know, we're, we're, you're going to get really introduced to this guy as we move through the next several chapters. So I'm just going to introduce you to him this morning, but I want to make the points that are necessary for us to understand about this priesthood. He said, and Melchizedek, first of all, was the king of Salem, the king of Jerusalem. When Jesus comes to reign again, what city will he be reigning from as the king of glory? Jerusalem. And not only was he a king, he says, King Jerusalem brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. A king could never be a priest and a priest could never be a king under the Levitical law. Jesus is king and priest and prophet. And here we have this Melchizedek. And when we, when we read through the verses that talk about him, he never had a beginning and he never has an end. They don't know where he came from. Neither having mother nor father. He just shows up. And he is the king of Jerusalem. And he is the high priest of the most high God because he brings blood and body to offer to Abraham, the father of faith. And then Abraham, as we see here, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed the Most High God, and he delivered thine enemies into his hand. And then we see Abraham tithing to him. You, you don't tithe to people. Under the Levitical law, you tithe to God. And so when he's first introduced, we understand something about this, this man, Melchizedek, that he was a priest who had no beginning, who has no end. He's a priest that comes to Abraham, the father of faith, as a, as a king of Jerusalem and as a priest of the Most High God. He serves communion, as we're going to take this morning, to Abraham, and he blesses Abraham. He's delivered Abraham from his enemies, and then Abraham ties back to him. That's our introduction to Melchizedek. And so Paul says, you misunderstand. I'm not saying, the scripture's not saying that Jesus was of the order of Aaron or, or of the Levitical priesthood. His priesthood predates it, millennial. He's of the order of Melchizedek, who never had a beginning, who never has an end, 
who's not only a priest, but he's a king. And he reigns over Jerusalem. And he initiated communion, where we were brought back in through his work into relationship. He blesses Abraham, and Abraham tithes to him. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears. Now he's speaking of Jesus here in chapter 7. There's some interesting things we need to unpack. He said, who, speaking of Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when Jesus took on human form, you can read it there in Philippians chapter 2, had offered up prayers. When did he offer up prayers? Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he's facing the cross, as he's going to offer himself as the sacrifice for sin and become our high priest. This was a traumatic moment in the life of Jesus. I don't believe for a moment it was because of the beatings he was about to take or the mocking or the scourging or even the crucifixion. Jesus knew what lie ahead for him. There was going to be a moment in time, six hours, where he's going to hang between heaven and earth and his father. God the Father would turn his back on God the Son. And that fellowship that sustained Jesus would be broken for that period of time as the sins of the world without admixture and full wrath are coming upon him and he's bearing as a sin bearer, he's bearing the sins of the world. And we see there on the cross, he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, he knows. Because he's bearing your sin, he's bearing my sin, he's bearing our sin. And by his death, because the wages of sin is death, he is paying for our sin on Calvary's cross. No high priest before that ever did that. And so in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears, Father, is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, your will be done with tears, was able to save from death, and was heard in that he feared. The idea is that he reverenced the Father. This is not phobia. This fear is a fear that God the Son had that he would ever disappoint God the Father. What an example to us. You know, we, we shouldn't fear sin because of the consequences of sin. So many people, you know, they fear the sin because there's consequences. That's the law. Listen, once you're born again, the fear we should have, it's not a phobia. It's a fear that we should ever disappoint our Father. In fact, when I sin, and I think I sinned one time back in 1984. I'm not really sure. <laughs> My wife. The Holy Spirit's in the house. You can't get away with anything. But you know, when I sin... You know, I go to the Father and say, Father, I, I've transgressed your law. I broke your law. And no doubt I broke your heart. And then I go to Jesus. Jesus, I, I don't know what's wrong with me because at that moment, I loved my sin more than I loved you. And I didn't consider, I didn't consider what it cost you to pay for my sin. I was selfish. And then, Holy Spirit, I grieved you. I quenched you. You warned me. And so for me, repentance is not just, oh, I'm sorry, move on. No, I go to the Father and say, man, I, I, I disappointed you. I know better. And Jesus, I just didn't consider what you had to go through to pay for that. And Holy Spirit, no doubt, I quenched you and grieved you. Forgive me. Father, wash me in the blood of your Son. Amen. Jesus, what he bore on Calvary's cross, what he bore before he went to the cross, and he says, listen, verse 8, though he were a son, he is the son of God. He is God incarnate. He's Emmanuel, God with us, yet he learned. And that word for learn, you know, it's old King James, um, you know, they wrestle with, how, and then the interpreters wrestle with, how do you get from Greek into English? Um, but here's, here's what he says, here's what it, it makes more sense to look at it this way. Though he were a son, yet he practiced obedience. By the things which he suffered. That, that when those things came, he remained faithful to the Father. 
And really he practiced, as it were, and he learned to practice obedience through the things he suffered. And being made perfect, that word again, I think it's a very poor translation. It, it also can be uh, translated, made consecrated. That he consecrated himself. Wholly devoted to the Father and to the will of the Father in this process of redemption for his creation. He being wholly devoted, consecrated. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Well, again, what is it that he's asking of us? Some Pharisees came, religious people, one day to Jesus and said, "What, well, good master, what must we do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, believe. This is the work of the Father that you put your faith in me. There's nothing you can do. See, that's what religion does. It's all about what you can do. And can I just tell you this morning, and I'm not trying to bum you out, and I'm not trying to anyways uh, diminish you know, your efforts, but there's nothing you can do, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing we can do that ever would satisfy the Father concerning our sin. Jesus did that for us. He is our high priest. And that's how we have access to the Father. He's the door. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. No man can go to the Father but by Him. Amen? That's why we put our trust for salvation, for justification, absolutely in the work of Christ. And I'm going to tell you, that's why I get so upset with some of these other religions. Well, you know, I had a guy come in here not so many years ago and said, well, you don't believe in water baptism for regeneration. I said, absolutely not. Because Christ plus something does not equal salvation. Christ and Christ alone saved me. Christ and Christ alone will defend me. And Christ and Christ alone one day will present me before the Father perfect. Amen? I get excited about that. I'm sorry. And I'm not going to let anybody else convince me of anything else. And then I got my wife that reminds me, you're right, you're right. Amen, amen. You're nothing. He's everything. Just like she did this morning. Which is good to be reminded of. So it says, called of God. Jesus Christ, called of God. A high priest. Not after the Levitical priesthood, but after the Melchizedek. Of whom we have many things to say. And hard to be uttered, seeing that you just are dull of hearing. You know, most people and most Christians don't study the Bible anymore. You go to churches and they preach little sermons to sermonettes about just, I don't even know what. We are those who want to study to show ourselves approved, workmen who need not to be ashamed. He said, listen, because, he says in verse 12, for when the time came that you ought to have been teachers, you should have sat under the solid teaching of God's word long enough that you become a teacher. But now you need to be taught again the first principles. He's talking to these Jews that are leaving Christ as their high priest after the order of Melchizedek and going back to Aaron and the law and the Levitical priesthood for justification. He said, listen, you've heard the truth so long, you should be teachers, but now you are going back and you have to relearn the first principles of the oracles of God. And you become such that need milk. You're sucking on a bottle instead of chewing on a ribeye. You, you're a strong meat for everyone. And listen, babies can't digest solid meat. There's a time when we all should drink milk. But that milk should cause us to grow and to mature to the point one day when the teeth pop in the mouth, when you see your parents up there bellying up at the table and, and they're having steak, you just go right up there too and say, cut me off a piece of that. I have teeth now. I'm maturing. Every, he says in verse 13, for everyone that useth milk, you know, I, I have people sending me stuff all the time. Hey, are, are, do, you, is there a, do you know a Bible teaching church in our area? We used to have a Bible teaching pastor, and he either retired or, or went to be with the Lord or has moved away. And the guy we got now, man, he's just like, it's like it's, there's no meat because they're just using milk. Milk is okay for a while, but guys, you need to grow in your faith. You need to grow in grace and in the knowledge. You will never be victorious in your Christian experience until you know who you are in Christ Jesus and what Christ Jesus has done for you and the strength and power of the Holy Spirit He's given you to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and you begin to feed because there's two dogs in your, in your life. 
the white dog and the black dog, and the one you feed is the one who's going to win the battle, and you're feeding the spiritual man. That's who we are in Christ. He said, but everyone that uses milk is unskilled, unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's just a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them, listen carefully, that are of full age, got teeth, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. You know, I've had a pastor call me up and said, it just doesn't seem like there's any discernment in the body of Christ because I'm going to go up and speak at a discernment ministry. That's what Brian Call is all about. And I said, the problem is not a lack of discernment. The problem is a lack of teaching of God's word to God's people, maturing them past being babies sucking on a bottle into being full-grown people mature who are eating meat. See, the problem is not all of these wackadoodles outside with all of their false teaching. The problem is the church is not being brought into the fullness of the truth of God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the world's in the condition it is because the church has failed to do its job to be salt and light because the pastors have failed to do their job in the pulpit today and teaching God's word and maturing God's people and making disciples so that you do have discernment. You know, so that you do when you hear something that's not right. You can say, that ain't right. Well, how come you think that's not right? Well, that, that's your truth and that, this is my truth. No, 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 there's one truth and here it is. And you can point them to it. Amen? Amen. And then, you know, how to win friends and influence people. That's what you'll find. But then he says, going into chapter 6, Therefore, leaving, we should grow past the principles of the doctrine of Christ. What's the doctrine of Christ? That he was God incarnate, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death on Calvary's cross, rose again the third day, ascended to the Father, ever lives to make intercession for us, and has poured out upon us this, this gift of grace that we might come and be saved through grace by faith. That's elementary. That's, that's Christianity 101. That's something we all should have our hands well wrapped around. And yet we're seeing in the church that are people are saying, well, Jesus didn't die for our sins. He just died and there's no substitutionary atonement. This whole, you know, emergent church movement and all the false teaching. We should know better. Amen? You should know better. I should know better. He said, let us go on to maturity. Laying not again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Now, this is something I have to unpack. Let me give me a minute. Because he's writing to Hebrew people that are going back to dead works for justification. To law, to religion. He said we should repent of dead works. Listen, some people in the church today are going back to legalism. Religion. You got to do these things. You got to be these things. You know, not be these things, but do these things to be justified. That's dead works. Again, what could you do? What can I do? What could any of us do? Listen, if the law would have worked, Jesus didn't need to come and die. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. All like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord put upon him the sin of us all. I owed a debt I could never pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. That's the theme of the gospel. And he had to be a perfect man to do that. So we understand that he was a high priest sent by God of the order of Melchizedek, not an earthly priesthood. And so he says, repentance from dead works and faith toward God. That's the message that God brought through Christ Jesus. You need to repent. Receive me and my sacrifice. Stop trying to do it yourself. And have faith in what God has done through me for your salvation. And of the doctrines of baptism. See, they had baptisms. And they had laying on of hands. And of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal life. And this we will do if God permits. That word if is not in the classical um, Greek, uh, class condition in the Greek, that word is, because if in the, in the Greek can mean three things. If and it might be, if and it is, uh, if and it might be, if and, uh, and it is. There's another one. Anyway, this is if and it will be. So here, here's what you need, because we're going to read through some passages here. I'm going to unpack them real quick. You need to know that God's will 
is for you to understand your salvation. God's will is for you to know that you are saved. John writes in 1 John chapter 5 and says, I write unto you, my little children, that you know that you have eternal life. And that life is in Christ Jesus. How many know for a fact this morning that your high priest has saved you? That he paid for your sins, that you are washed in the blood, that he regenerated you through the Spirit, that he wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he's there right now as Satan, the accuser of the brother, stands before God day and night and accuses you. He's there to defend you. And by the way, he's never lost a case. That's our high priest. Amen? So he says this. Now, this is, I'm just going to read through... Um, I'm going to read through verse 6. I'm going to read verses uh, 4, 5, and 6. Th this, this market in your Bible is the most controversial section in all of Scripture. I've read to a nauseam people's comment, commentators on this subject. And I'm going to tell you, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how they mis get, misunderstand this. Now, let me give you a, a little understanding here this morning. Please, just give me a few moments. When you come to a section of Scripture as a student of the Bible, and it's hard to understand. You know, Peter, that's why we know that, that Paul is writing to the Hebrews, because Peter said, and our brother Paul, who's written unto you as well, some things hard to understand. Even Peter was scratching his head on what Paul is about to say. But in Latin, this is, um, the word is reducto ad absurdium, which means Paul is going to reduce something to an absurdity to prove a point. And so when you come to passages uh, that you may not understand that could be misinterpreted, you, then you, you, you let the Bible interpret itself. You judge them by the things you already know. You already know. Let the Bible interpret itself. And so if you come to this passage here, and many people say, well, see, you can sin away your salvation. You can lose your salvation. And the Armenians who taught that, they get most of the authority from these next three verses. And, and I will tell you this morning, you cannot sin away your salvation if you truly were born again. Because you have a high priest. Oh, you can be taken to the woodshed. And you can be disciplined. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove that point in a few moments. But this is an absurdity. Now listen carefully to what Paul says. Well, I'll read it and then come back and unpack it. For it is impossible for those who once were enlightened, that revelation of the truth of God has come to their heart and mind, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, the gift of salvation. That word tasted means they've tasted, they've ate it, they've partaken, they've digested it. And have been partakers of the Holy Spirit. We are saved through that regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. And have tasted of the good word of God. And of the power of the world to come. And here's what it means. And if it were possible for them to fall away. If it was possible, if you've had this experience to fall away. Then what would have to happen to renew you. Renew you again, again, circle that word again, to renew you again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh and putting him to an open shame. What they're saying is what Jesus did, because he's not of the Levitical priesthood, he's of the Melchizedek priesthood, what he did was so powerful and so perfect that if you think it's possible, to send away the salvation, you're crazy. Because if it were possible for you to leave the salvation once you've truly been born again, then for you to be brought back. Now, let me ask you this before we get and prove a point here. How many have been born again, are Christians, backslid for a time, and God brought you back? How many raise your hand? See, this verse would be confusing to you because some would say, well, I can't come back. I might as well give up and throw in the towel. I might as well walk away because I've sinned. And, and I've had people come to me and talk about this. Now listen to what it says here. This is very important. Because if it were possible for you to lose your salvation, that word for renew, that, that word in the, in the Greek for renew is anachinizo. It would mean that you have to bring something afresh and anew back. Other words, for you to be renewed again, Jesus would have to come again. Die on the cross again. Be put to shame again. To 
to bring you back to salvation. The priests and the Levitical priests would offer the same sacrifice. Watch as we go through chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, over and over and over, which can never take away sin. But this man didn't cover your sin. He took it away. And so this thinking that you can walk away from the Lord, try it. Try it. No, no, please don't. But if you did. I knew when I got saved, I was forever ruined for this world. I, I, go back to what? Go back to what? Oh, you can, you can visit there once in a while. How many visited back the old life recently? But you can't live there. Amen? This is what he's saying. Because they're saying, well, you know, some are saying, well, they're going back. Well, no, they're not. They just think they are. Because it would be impossible for them to be renewed if they could sin away their salvation. Because if they could do that, for them to come back to salvation would mean that Jesus would have to come again and die for their sins again. Afresh, anew. And he ain't doing that. Now, let me give you some verses before we close. I want to get to this point, and I'll read a few more verses, and we'll, we'll, we'll take communion. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you. How many know that Christ began a good work in you? Raise your hand. He began. Well, guess what? He began a good work in you. We'll perform it. Who's going to perform it? Jesus. Unto the day of Jesus Christ when he comes for you. Listen, he's able to finish what he started in you. Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you, to keep me, to keep us from what? Falling and present us. What's that next word? How is God going to present? How is Jesus going to present you before God on that day when we're raptured and we go home to be with the Lord? Or if we just say, you know, we, we get stupid and this body wears out and, and the Lord just says, hey, you know, go get him. Go get her. They need to come home. Um, so how is he going to present us? Faultless. Who's going to do that? Jesus. Before the presence of his glory with what? Exceeding joy. Hebrews chapter 7. Now, I need to make this point because I want to drive this home because this is the point we're going to build on in the next weeks and months to come as we walk through chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 7, verse 27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for their own sin and then for the sins of the people. For this he, that is Jesus, did once. He offered up himself the perfect sacrifice. Only needed to be done once. If you backslide, listen, his grace is still covering you. And he will bring you back. He's not coming back a second time to die on a cross a second time. To raise again a second time. To be put to shame a second time. What he did is once and forever. Once and done. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. And Paul will just keep reminding us as we walk through this section. Chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Once. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Yeah, he's coming back a second time. But not to offer himself for your sins because you backslid. He's coming back a second time to receive you unto himself. To set up his kingdom. And then Hebrews, my favorite one in chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Listen carefully. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin until the next time you sin. Does it say that? This man, the man Christ Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for ever, he sat down. Why did he why was he seated? Because the work is done. Levitical priesthood, there was no seats for the priests. They worked from sun up to sundown offering for sins. But Jesus said, it's done. To tell us that, it's finished. For this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, he hath perfected. Tell your neighbor you're perfect in Christ. Don't forget the in Christ part. 
perfected, 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 perfect, perfected. So if you get in a fight with your husband and wife, just look at them and say, perfect. And then you'll learn obedience by the things you suffer. <laughs> nope. In Christ Jesus, this morning, when God the Father looks at you and he looks at me, he sees perfection. Those things that are not as though they already were. As he said to the nation of Israel, I see no iniquity in Israel. I see no perversion in Judah. By one offering, he, Christ, has perfected for how long? For how long? Can you send it away if he made you perfect forever? Can you send it away? Can you send it away? Forever, them that he, listen carefully, that word sanctified means he made, he made, he made, he made you, and he made me through that sacrifice of Christ, our high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, he made us holy. He didn't cover our sin like the Levitical priest who did. No, he removed it. He made it so it was though when God looks at you, you're so justified, it's just as though you never were a sinner. Because you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been regenerated by that work of the Spirit. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And Jesus did that for us. By one sacrifice, He has made you perfect forever. And those He made perfect, He declared to be holy. Man, wrap your hands around that. You can't improve on that. We have become the righteousness of God through Christ. As we put our faith in Him. Oh, the other one wants to come and condemn you. There is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ. We're not being condemned. Now, you can be corrected, but you'll never be condemned. Now, let's just read a few more verses and we'll have communion. I, so I can tie a knot in this and we have to move back. For he says, For the earth drinketh in the rain and cometh upon it, and it bringeth forth herbs meat meant for the dressing of their, those who do, do the farming. They receive a blessing from God. And then there's those who bear thorns and thistles, rejected, and they're cursed, and they're to be burned. So you have two kinds of people on the planet. Those who are received, and those who are rejected. Let me ask you, what are you? Have you received? Then what do you got to worry about? Rain and blessing. If you reject, you got a lot to worry about. Burn. But we are those who received. Received what? Grace, forgiveness, hope, eternal life. And we, just, listen to what he says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered unto the saints and do minister. We, listen, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full, listen, to the full assurance of hope unto the end. We're not saved by works. We're saved that we put our hope, our trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Listen, you are as saved by grace on your worst day as you are on your best day. And this is the problem I see in Christian today. Because when you're really doing good, then you become legalistic. You become, you know, judgmental and full of pride. Well, I'm better than that person. No, you're not. You are not. Well, pastor, that's harsh. No, it's not harsh. I'm trying to keep you from pride. You're just a beggar showing another beggar where the bread's at. You've tasted and seen that God is good. You want other people to eat the same bread. Amen? But we have full assurance and hope. Hope in who? Hope in Christ Jesus after the order of Melchizedek, not after the Levitical priesthood. We have hope in him. This is what he says in verse 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and endurance inherit the promises. You didn't earn it. You inherited it. And you inherited it because through faith and through endurance, you stayed the course. You're going to inherit the promises. For when God made promises to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself that if you put your faith in me, then I will do the work. 
Oh, and by the way, when he made that covenant with Abraham, he put him in a deep sleep. Abraham wasn't even a part of it. God made that covenant. Listen, Christian. If you truly are born again, you want to please the Father, just like Jesus agonizing in the garden. But there are going to be times you're not going to please the Father. That flesh and that spirit are warring. But you need to know that what Jesus did for you, what he did for me, what he did for us, is so complete and so permanent that one day he will present us faultless. Amen? Now that ought to make you worship. You know, I thought about having the worship service after the teaching this morning. Because if this doesn't wind your clock, then you may not be saved. But I don't know what it does for you to know that I am a sinner condemned unclean. And what I've earned and what I deserve is hell. And God sent his son, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, to die a substitutionary death on Calvary's cross for my sins, rose again the third day to prove that he is the first born among the resurrection, that he has life, and if he has it, he can give it. Ascended to the Father, and he ever lives to make intercession for me, and salvation is by grace, and it's a gift. And I received it. And I don't care what people say, I'm never going to lose it. And I'm expecting one day for my father to say to Jesus, his son, go get your bride. And I'm already sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I have the engagement ring and it's in my heart. And he's coming for me. Not because I deserve it, but because he's merciful. Amen. You know, husbands should understand this. Your wife didn't marry you because you deserved her. Who said amen? That was a good guy. No. Because she's merciful. Now, I know that to be true. But God loves you. Look to your neighbor and say that God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit loves you. And his love is unconditional. And he can't wait to bring you home. He can't wait to bring you home. Amen. So, to prove their point, they said, no, 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 no. Jesus is not after the Levitical line. He's not a Levi. He's not after the priesthood of Aaron. He's of a superior priesthood. His priesthood predates Aaron's priesthood. His priesthood is from the line of Melchizedek, who never had a beginning, who will never have an end, who's both a king and a priest. And he came out and offered communion, his blood and his body, to Abraham, the father of faith. And Abraham honored him by tithing, giving back to him of the spoil of his life. And that's who we serve. Amen? If you can stand...